Okay, everyone, another great guest today, amazing classics writer during his writing days. He is a great coach and current DS for the Lidl Trek team. Steven de Jonga joins us today. Yenzi, what did you think about our chat with Steven? Oh, it was fantastic. Some good old memories, but I'm also super impressed how he is opening up to this modern world of cycling, you know, letting us understand a little bit how teams work in these days. What are they doing to improve? And I believe they will improve a lot coming next year. Yeah, you're right. He tells us a little bit about how active they were in the transfer market and their goals for next year. So sit back and relax and enjoy our talk today with Steven de Jonga. All right, everyone. Steven de Jonga, welcome to Bobby and Jens. Welcome. Man, I tell you, it was uh, great seeing you at the Maryland Cycling Classic. But, you know, the Vuelta, the Tour of Spain just finished. And what a wild race that was. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about more, more about that here in the future. But um, listen, there's, there's a month to go in the cycling season. What, what races are remaining on the calendar for, for Lidl Trek from now until the end of the year? Well, still a lot. Uh, tomorrow we'll start with Tour of Luxembourg. So uh, high hopes on that. We have Chicone there in the lineup. And uh, he had a big break and a good build-up towards the end of the season. So, uh, yeah, Lombardy is one of his goals. So let's hope he starts out well. Then for the Classics, guys, we have the block uh, coming up. A few one-day races in Belgium. And then we're ending that in uh, Paris Tours. And then there's still uh, Croatia. The last stage race we do in uh, Europe after Luxembourg. And we have Guangxi, China, and then Japan Cup. So uh, where Popo will be our, yeah, the main contender, of course, in Tokyo. Yeah, he's the legend there. So. <laughs> and um, what races are you going to be at? You cannot cover all of it. Um, how many no, more days no, no. you have to go with your team? I will do Franca Bells. It's a new designed uh, course this year, so it will be quite hard. Uh, after that, I will be in uh, Binge, Shiman Binge, uh, Paris Bourg, and Paris Tour. So uh, that will be my last race block. Your last race block. That 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 makes me think that uh, you could actually step in to uh, fill a, a roster spot if needed, because is it true that you are still just as fit as you were when you were a racer? And to our listeners and viewers that don't know, Steven de Jonga was a, an amazing rider, very good at the classics. Um, one of the most defining characteristics to this day, when I think of Steven de Jonga is a guy that would roll up to the start line and it would be freezing outside, and I'd have arm warmers, long gloves, a vest, a hat under my helmet, knee warmers, the whole probably booties, probably some little like hand warmers under my gloves. And this cat would roll up with short sleeves and shorts on and be ready to roll. But Steven, like, could you actually step into the, the Peloton right now with your current fitness level? Because when I saw you, you looked pretty damn fit. No, I'm fit, but I think with the high level we have now, I think I would not survive until the end. No, maybe I will do a good job the first hundred kilometer as a domestic, but uh, no, I would certainly have to pick my terrain and my race. That's for sure. But no, I'm happy with the fitness I have, and I try to stay fit a little bit. Uh, yeah, after taking care of so much years of my body as a professional, I think it's a waste to just throw that away. And what I also enjoy in wintertime is going out with the riders on camps just to talk with them because you have a completely different conversation uh, on the bike than when you're on, yeah, face to face on the room talking to them. So for me, it's important to, you know, be there at the camps, have a little ride with them, talk to them because the conversation is so much easier. And especially with the new guys coming into the team, it's, it's much easier to know them. Because actually you're on, a, on the same level there on the bike. Okay, now since we're already going that uh, direction, uh, one last fun question before we start more professional questions. Honest answer, please, Steam. You think you and me 
if we would jump back, I mean, being younger, of course, if we would jump back into modern cycling, would we enjoy it? Would we be good at the modern cycling right now? And could we compete against the best guys today? Or we had our times and we are made for the old system? I think we we would be pretty good, uh, Bobby. I think or oh, Jens. I think we would be pretty good because, yeah, we were racers. We 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 love to race, and I think we were also really professional. And uh, yeah, we would adapt to the, all the things that there were now: the food, the the training, and so on. Um, yeah, I think we would enjoy it. But cycling is changed. That's for sure. What I don't like nowadays is the road infrastructure, but I think in our days it was still quite okay and there was there was some roundabouts, there were some poles on the side of the road, but nowadays in Europe it's just madness. There's so much so much road furniture on the road that it's quite dangerous. And I think this we wouldn't like. No. What do you think has been that change in the Peloton where we're seeing these amazing results like week after week and the speeds and just the the excitement what do you think has um been the reason or the driving force behind that this new modern age of cycling i think the the tracking of all the data what we have now i think the systems what what analyze the data is been uh, is, is going yeah better and better uh the material uh in our days, there was not that much progression in tires, in bikes, in frames, and so on. But now everybody is looking for that percentage extra in their tires, in their frame, uh, in aero position, in clothing. I can remember, I think, the first four years when I was professional, our shirt always stayed the same. TT suit was almost not important. And I think nowadays they are looking so much into detail that you know, if you don't do an update on the TT suit in the year itself, you're already running behind. So, you know, there's so much into, uh, yeah, innovation that, that, that makes the sport so much faster. And yeah, and like I said, the nutrition is completely changed. I think uh, the way the riders fuel now is so much better than we did. And also the knowledge behind it is, yeah, it makes sense. I think... Uh, why I was bunking before, like back in the days, I was just not eating enough. And I thought I did a good job there, but I was really not eating enough by far by eating from good, you know, like, yeah, it's a shame. But that's why I think nowadays I would do better in those long races, because with the knowledge we have now, you know, I should eat way more carbs and so on. Um, a question to that. Now you said there's uh, the people try to improve everywhere a little bit. How do teams do that? You hire more people or the people in the team just work more and more hours per day because somebody got to book the wind tunnel, somebody got to drive there, somebody got to get the bikes there, somebody got to put them together and so on and so on. It's it's more people. Yeah, it's more people working now. And, and also, uh, yeah, the budget, uh, what allows us now to, to do the research for those things. I think uh, with Lidl stepping in, we have more budget. Uh, we can do more things. Last week, uh, a number of riders were in the wind tunnel, testing several TT suits, testing road road clothing on normal bike, uh, clothing on TT bike. Yeah, and in the past, maybe that was on the beginning of the season, you know, and there it stopped. And now we are looking like helmets. Okay, uh, this helmet, this type is good for this rider. But what does it do with the other rider? Or is he faster with another brand? Or, you know, so if you look at our TT riders or in the TT, they are almost using another helmet. So we are li really looking into detail. Okay, wh which is the fastest helmet for which rider? And uh, yeah, we try to give them the, yeah, the support they need. When, okay, so from the technical side, that's that's one thing. I think that's well documented that, you know, clothing and equipment is getting bigger. Um, I kind of looked at your race season and Lidl Trek has upwards of plus or minus 200 race days a year. Back when you and I and Jens were racing, we often did 
uh, over a hundred races a year. Now riders are doing a lot less, but they're doing a lot more altitude camps. Tell us how you as a DS and as a coach use those altitude camps in the phase plan of the riders in order to optimize their, their season. Well, now we were quite limited because we didn't have the resources over the past year. So we had to plan our money well and our budget well. But for next year, we are already planning with like, um, yeah, the, the different uh, groups for the Grand Tours and also for maybe the, the classics guys, the, the altitude camps. And next year we will do less race days, for example, even if that we have more riders, we will do less race days and try to prepare better for, for each race. So we will even go down in race days and, you know, do more camps and be better prepared for the races. Um, doing more camps makes absolute sense because that's what some big teams do and they, they perform well. But how do you think, how you keep the riders motivated? I mean, when are they going to see their family, their kids, their girlfriends? You know, because if you're in a training camp, you cannot bring the family for barbecue for five days. That's not really what you guys want as a team, I well, suppose. Well, I think, I think if you look at... Uh what the biggest team doing at the moment, like Jumbo Fisma, they invite the family to the camps. Uh, so, I didn't know. No, they, and it's already what they do like a couple of years that in the lead up to the tour, the family is welcome. The kids are there. Uh, also not forget that we have already a number of riders living in altitude, for example, in, uh, in Andorra. So they are surrounded by family. And then it's also easier to plan camps there because everybody is already in the neighborhood. But, uh, yeah, uh, in the winter, you cannot do a perfect camp there in, in Andorra because everybody is skiing and it's way too cold. So then you're looking for places like Tenerife and so on. And there we all know that the space is limited and, you know, family cannot come there. But uh, for sure, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's something we have to take in uh in mind that, you know, also in the lead up to the Tour de France, uh, seeing their riders now and then, uh, the family, I think it's important and we should accommodate that, I think. Yeah, time away from home counts as a, as a race day, in, in my opinion, if it's a training camp or not. But Stephen, you said something there pretty interesting that you and I actually lived through was we were together on a team, Team Sky, where people were looking at our team and wondering what we were doing different because we were so successful. And you kind of mentioned that, you know, that Yumbo is doing X, Y, and Z. Um, how is it in this world? Are you constantly kind of looking over the fences at other teams to see how you can improve? Or is it just that organic, you know, trek, a uh, little trek, organization that that really drives all these programs because man there we're we're in a spot that i don't think cycling has ever seen with the dominance of one team both in the grand tours stage races classics um there's got to be a little bit of hey what can we, what what are these other teams doing or am i totally wrong no, no, no. We are also looking like, okay, what could we do better? Or, you know, where can we spend more to, to be better? And yeah, we all come, I think, to the, to the same conclusion that, yeah, if you have more resources to spend, you can pay more attention in detail. You can put more people onto the nutrition side. You can put more coaches into the coaching of the riders and so on and support of the riders. Plus the camps, I think that, that, yeah, uh, will help a lot. And also with the camps, if you put those riders together, they are building together towards the goal. And I think this is also, yeah, very good for the, for the team process. Like, you know, you work together to a goal, you're all there, you go to the same shit, you train in the same, yeah, hopefully <laughs> not too much shitty weather, but you go through the same shit in training, you suffer a lot, and you work towards this goal. And I think for the team process, this is important. Instead of coming in, you know, you do separate camps, you come in together for the big goal, 
it's different, I think. Um, now, we talked about uh, looking at all the little details and everywhere. Um, how about working with a psychologist? Because, you know, back in our days, you would just laugh and you go, oh, you're a softie, you just go home. Nowadays, um, is, that, is that a thing, working with a psychologist? Uh, people are open about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are working already a few years now with a psychologist. Uh, it's so hard to pronounce this. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Same for me. Same for me. Yeah. But uh, for three years now, uh, we work with uh, Elisabetta. And in the beginning, it's kind of a hard start, you know, because, yeah, uh, she's Italian, but she speaks really good English. And I think the, the bar was high to reach out to her. But now that she's already so long around the team, the bar is really low and she's really approachable and... I think there we we really do a good job. But now, of course, with all the new riders, the extra riders coming in, we have the women team which is getting more riders. We have a development team coming up. You know, also there we need to expand. Uh, so, yeah, it's 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 way different than in our time. You know, it's uh, we didn't have that support uh, for sure, but it's it's good that they have it now. And I think. Uh, With all the media attention nowadays, uh, I think it's really good they have this this option of, of reaching out if they are having problems or mental stress about things. I'm also interested. You know, you, your team switched sponsors in the in the middle of the year, and you've mentioned multiple times that that has allowed you to have a little bit more money. What are the challenges of switching? from Trek Segafredo to Lidl Trek in the middle of the season. I think it was the Tour de France where you guys have switched, uh, officially switched over, right? Yeah, it was a nightmare, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Now, all the cars had to be re-wrapped. The bus had to be re-wrapped. Uh, the trucks had to be re-wrapped. And all these logistics had to be yeah, ready for the tour now. But you all know that you have Dauphiné, you have Tour de Swiss, where you all need these big vehicles. So it was pretty hard and yeah, really hats off to the, to the people in the office who, who made it work. And, uh, yeah, in the last moment, we also had the clothing design, what changed. So all the clothing was almost produced and then we had a little change. So then they could start over again. So yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty hectical, but we were there. We were at the start. They all had their clothing. The buses were wrapped, the trucks were wrapped and yeah, actually. I think we did have a good uh, a good start, and uh, uh, yeah, we had a lot of compliments for uh, for the look we we created or they created for us. Yeah, definitely, and it was nicely visible with the big yellow patch, for example. It was really from the helicopter view. It was really good to spot the riders for us in the car as well. And the riders were also happy because before we had this blue sport director car and when they look back, they could never see us because we were just dark blue. But now with, with the yellow, the red and, and the big logo from Lidl there on the bonnet. Yeah. They were happy because they straight away could spot the car and they know, ah, we are there, you know, we, we can drop back. Yeah. Jeez. I mean, but you guys, from the beginning of the year, you guys have been, quite successful you've got what 27 wins so far this year and yeah there, and there's you know mads Pedersen, who's been on the podcast before you know he's he's a champion right but in i think it was a in february at twelve de Bessege, um i remember asking jens because jens has a little bit of an affiliation with trek who is this Matthias Skimosa guy that won a stage in in Lie or in Etoile de Bessege? And then, like, he just kept getting these results. Another Danish rider. And then he wins the Tour de Suisse. He he wins the, the race in Maryland, the Maryland Cycling Classic. Tell us a little bit about this kid, because before the Etoile de Bessege, he wasn't really on my radar. And now... I mean, he's he's an upcoming star of the sport. Well, he, he joined the team two years ago. And, uh, yeah, he was a very promising rider as a junior. Then he got suspended because he, he was found positive on a, yeah, on a substance. He didn't know what was in the supplement, so that was very unfortunate. 
And then, of course, yeah, you are not welcome uh, anymore for a lot of teams. So he went through a really difficult time as a, as a junior. And then, yeah, uh, we were in contact with him. We kept supporting him. He came to the team uh, with all this corona and so on. You know, those guys didn't have a lot of race days. He came to the team. The first year, he had a really nice program. We saw he was progressing throughout all the year. And then last year, yeah, he was starting to make already the first results. He was winning Luxembourg, what was really a boost for his morale because then he finally won a GC, no? And yeah, also before Luxembourg last year, he did several good results. And this year he made the next step. And I think this year he really confirmed that he's, he's a great talent. And, uh, yeah, winning, winning to the Swiss was something amazing for him. Uh, yeah, I think he has seven wins this season. And no, he's, he, he's a great rider. He's very professional. And yeah, we had a talk long actually in Canada. And I also said to him, I said, Matthias, don't try to change anything what you're doing. You know, don't think that you need to change now more on the nutrition side or more on the training side. I said, what you do is good now. You know, don't, how do you call that? Exaggerate because that's when the thing goes wrong. And I think it was it was a good chat. I think, yeah, it's a it's a nice guy, and you know, always always giving, uh, always thankful, uh, humble, and I think, uh, yeah, that's what makes him great to work with. If if we allow to look a little further in the future for next year, now you have the signing with Tao Kuegen Hart, you have Skiel Mose, who is an upcoming talent, maybe already almost a champion next year, one year older, one year, you know, stronger. Um, what are the plans for Grand Tours? You go all in for the tour with both of them, or is there already an ID you can share with us going into next year with, I mean, no, I think first of all, first of all, now we are waiting for the, for the calendar. So end of September, the UCI will release all the 2.1 and two pro races and one pro and, and so on. So then we can finally fill the, fill in the cal calendar totally. And in October, we will go to headquarters in Waterloo with the whole team. And I think there it's time that we start to speak about, about plans. We, we cannot forget that Tao, of course, he had a terrible injury. He's still recovering from that. So, uh, I think it's hard to set a goal now. Okay, we want to win the Giro with Tao because I think that's quite, you know, unrealistic because first I think it's more important he comes back and he comes back strong and we can give him the time that he comes back. Uh, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to next year because we also signed uh, a lot of other good riders and support riders. So uh, I think now we are standing currently around fifth, sixth place and I think, I hope we can finish off in the world two ranking in the first five because that would be a huge success for us we already have the best ever season in track history in the amount of wins and if we can also finish off yeah with the first five in in, in the ranking in the world two that would be would be awesome and i think then for next year with the signings we did we should aim higher so uh yeah i think that would be Uh, the main goal to just to do better in the Grand Tours in general uh, and, and win more races, of course. Be competitive, actually, in all the races we are doing. Yeah, I mean, l let's face it. I know that in cycling, in, in any sport, uh, winning is the number one priority. But in our sport, you lose a lot more than you win. And you said something there mentioning Mateus which reminds me of something my dad used to say to me, like, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. So like you, you kicked us a little bit of your, your coach knowledge there. Like, Hey, Mateus, don't change anything. Don't go extreme. Don't exaggerate. So what as a, as a DS slash coach, do you try to ingrain in the riders um, through, through certain periods of, of the season or through good times and bad? Because, You know, winning, winning is great. And when you win, it's like, you know, hey, what do we do now? We win more. But throughout the season, there's some ups and downs. So what is your coaching philosophy there around riders that, you know, have some ups and downs throughout the season? 
I think the the most important part is is when you are having a down that you should not lose the you should not lose morale and you should uh, stay professional. I think uh, we all experience that if you do the things you have to do, you do them right, the results will come back. But it's very easy that if you're already down, okay, then you know, okay, at dinner I will take a beer or I will take two beers. Or, you know, ah, I had a bad day. Today I deserve a, a McDonald's check, snack or whatsoever, no? And, or, okay, uh, there's five hours uh, within the vaults, but okay, I will do four and, you know, I will skip a little bit less because I don't feel good. And I think this is something what, what, what is important if you not have the, how we say that, if you're not in a good vibe to train because the form is not there. I think if you keep being professional, you rest well, you eat well, you train well, the results will come back. And I think this is something what is really important to tell the, the younger riders. The older riders all experienced it, experienced it, it I think, already before. But it's, it's easy to to slip, I think, uh, away from professionalism if you're, in a, if you're in a bad spot. Okay, another question, a philosophical question about your coaching. If, let's say, the Vuelta just finished, right, and was a super interesting race, let's say the Vuelta next year, you leading the competition with Skelmose, with Chicone, and Tau, one, two, three, How would you negotiate that? How, how would you deal with that? Is who's in any... the lead? Yes, one, two, three. Who... Yeah, in the who's Vuelta. in the lead? Ah, who's, who's in, in the lead? Ha. Huh. Um, then I would go... Um, I'll Chico... stop there. Stop okay. Stop there. Because <laughs> who's in the lead, he deserves to win for me. Yeah. Because he took the leader's jersey. And I think the, the two riders behind him, they should support the leader. If it goes wrong... And he cracks completely. Okay. And we're risking to lose place two and three. Okay. Then we have to defend and we have to leave him behind. But until he doesn't crack, we defend our leader. And I think that's the way to go. But, but you, you get this, the situation. Like I'm, I, I'm old school and I agree a hundred percent with you when I was watching the Vuelta. Like, Gosh, this doesn't feel right. And on top of that, it was an American that I obviously wanted to win. But it's got there. There's no open and closed case here. I mean, there's so many things open to interpretation that that situation just seemed a little special. Let's face it. We've never had a season where a team has won all three Grand Tours with three different riders. Um We have never had a season where the young riders in each of those three Grand Tours were different, right? So, I mean, there's there's just so much talent out there, and you guys are starting to amass a, a juggernaut, you know, perhaps the next team that can compete at that level, both in the classics and the stage races, with the super team of the moment Jumbo Visma. So with that in mind, what was on your shopping list when you guys started so aggressively in the transfer market this year, where did you guys feel that you needed to improve the most? Well, I think that on the, um, on the GC side, we needed somebody with already the GC experience. So I think there with Tao winning already the, The Giro before and the form he had this year on Giro was, yeah, was really good. So I think there we did a really good job. Also, not forget that a lot of riders, GC riders, were on contract already for for a long time. So yeah, <laughs> uh, it's hard to get them out of contract. Uh, and the other question is, do you want to do it? So I think with Tao being available, we are super happy that he chose for us because in the end. The riders, it's the riders' choice also to come to our team, and he truly believed in in our project, and I think that is that is also great for us. Um, on the sprinting side, I think with Jonathan Milan, uh, yeah, we signed definitely uh, a, a huge talent, and uh, what this kid did in uh, in the Giro, winning multiple stages, winning the points jersey, 
being successful also on, on the track. I think there's there's a lot in this guy. Uh, we bought some guys who can do lead out. Uh, so I think on that side, you know, Mats is not the only one who has to deliver results now from February until like last weekend he finished by this bit in Eastberg, he finished second again. This guy is doing so many points this year for us. It's amazing. And it would be nice if we can, you know, score points with more guys uh, in general, like big points. Yeah. What do you think that we need a different transfer system in cycling, like in soccer, where you buy people out of their contracts? Or is it an advantage of cycling that you sign a contract and you fulfill the contract? I mean, every 10 years, once somebody breaks the contract, maybe. I think a transfer system could be good, uh, especially when you have a Devo team like we are starting now. I think if you you raise those kids and they can be, you know, just being signed under another team uh, for more money and you get nothing for it. I think that's, uh, I think that's weird. Uh, But yeah, well, I think we we should more change the system, like with uh, the TV, TV money and the income of the TV. I think there's something pretty wrong in that. The yeah, how do you say that? The in the balance, in the balance, yeah, in the maybe. balance. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, in football, if they start in Champions League uh, before they start, they already get paid like 15 million or whatever money. And uh, I think something, yeah, similar should be done if you start in in with with the good teams, with the world two teams in the big competitions. I think the start money we get, I think doesn't mean so much. I think it's not not good enough. And uh, yeah, I realize also that you know uh, organizing in Corona times was not easy. It cost a lot of money, uh, and so on and so on. But still, I think that yeah. They cannot do any competition without the teams. And I think there is a little bit of disbalance. And I think there should be more talking uh, between the teams and the organizers to get that a little bit more right, I think. And kind of switching gears here a little bit, um, would you be able to give us an update on on how Quinn Simmons is doing? We had him on the podcast in the in the spring and, you know, he had a he had a crash. I believe he had a, a concussion. Uh, how's he doing and is he going to be back racing by the end of the year or is it going to be full build over the winter for next year? No, no, he will be back racing. Actually, uh, he's training well now. So the last four weeks, he did a big block of uh, endurance work. Last week, he was doing his first intervals again. And yeah, he's feeling good and he's back on a pretty good level. And he will come back to race uh, in Croatia, where he will do a stage race. And after that, he will also do a one-day race in Belgium. And then he will finish the season. So, uh, yeah, I'm happy for Quinn that he can finally go back to racing because the concussion was pretty bad and he had some, yeah, uh, pretty long consequences of the crash. So uh, it's not easy to deal with. Well, while we're already talking at crashes, um, you're Stephen de Jong. We, we, sorry, we have to ask a question yeah. at least about uh, your uh, crash you had in, um, I believe, October 2018. Um, do you remember anything? What is your version? What is your story of, of all that? Well, actually, of the crash, I remember nothing. I don't know what happened. Uh, in the end, I know that my wife actually saved my life because she was very, she went at one point very aggressive on Twitter and asked for help. And then finally, you know, with, with the support on Twitter coming up, uh, the police realized that maybe this is an important guy or we should, you know, we should put some more resources on this. <laughs> and I was found. And yes, I'm super, super happy that she did that because uh, when I was found, my body temperature already was down uh, I think it was a little bit more than 34 degrees Celsius. And, but what happened, I don't know. I went a lot of time. I went back to that place and yeah, I have kind of an idea what could have happened, but what really happened, I have no clue. 
but uh, I was not hit by a car because my bike was okay, but I definitely went out of the way for something. And yeah, I think that a car came up and I avoided the crash. So I went to the right and I went off the road. That's what I think what happened. But it could also be an animal or whatsoever what I tried to avoid. I definitely tried to avoid something that I went off the road because in the the scan of my brain, they didn't find anything that I had a bleeding. Uh, my heart was perfectly normal, so nothing happened to my heart. Uh, blackouts I never had before, I never had after, so that's also something, you know, what we can uh, tick off the list. So, yeah, my only thing, what I think is that, yeah, I avoided something and I went off the road to avoid a crash or whatsoever so uh yeah i think we will we will never know but i'm really happy that uh i had my strava on because my strava stopped and uploaded so they had a kind of an idea where i was and where where they had to look uh and yeah i'm, I'm super thankful that my wife kept on insisting that they had to keep on looking because First thing they said was, ah, but he will be drinking something, you know, in the bar and he will be drinking a beer with his mates. So no worry, he will show up. But yeah, my wife knows me. If I say, okay, I go for two hours, then I'm home in two hours. And if I have a flat tire, I will call her and say, hey, I have a flat tire. I will be a little bit more late, you know. Uh, so she knew something was wrong. And in the end, yes, she was right. There was something wrong. Well, I remember that day very well. Christian Vanevelde called me up and he said, hey, have you heard about Stephen de Jonga? And I was like, well, I haven't heard from him in a couple of years. What do you mean? Like, he's missing. Uh, we have all of our friends in the Girona area out, out looking for him. And just, just to be clear for our listeners and our viewers, he was out on a training ride by himself. He wasn't like in a, in a, in a group ride or anything like that. We all go out solo. Um, but you mentioned it. I was going to ask about it. I mean, the fact that your head unit timed out and your Strava file uploaded, so they had kind of a straight line, like, okay, this is where he started. This is where he is. And they had an idea of where you were, but it was kind of like down in a very hidden ravine um, as, a, as I understand. Do you think that having Strava on that day uh, saved your life? Yeah, I think so. I I must also say that I always tell my wife that, okay, you know, I, I'm going to do like this and this loop. So she had a kind of an idea where I was going. But yeah, with the Strava on, of course, and yeah, with the file there, they they actually had a spot where, okay, he, he you know, he is there somewhere. Uh, so yeah, that was that was for sure very very helpful. Yeah, and I think nowadays all the head units have like this 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 tracker where you can just switch on that you if you have a crash, you know, it will call to a number. And I think this is this is very how we say it useful to uh, to use like this crash detector or yeah or the or the location. Just share your ride when you're riding. You know, it's uh, it's super easy to do and yeah uh yeah it can be helpful very helpful i can tell <laughs> yeah well and, and i guess of course it's safer to go out with two or three riders right with a friend so then you know some can help the other but sometimes you know you just don't want to talk you know just want time for yourself to reflect a little bit so then i guess yes these a crash tracker is a good thing and and, and you believe most modern units have it now I know that Wahoo, Wahoo, you can you can you can share the location. I know uh, Garmin has like the crest detection. So then, actually, if you connect to the phone, it will, you know, call actually, and that works quite well. Yeah. Well, let's make this a learning moment then for our viewers and our listeners. Um, one of the things I remember about you was you would get up very early in the morning and do your famous dawn patrol rides, and I remember walking. And and you still do it. And it's pretty freaking impressive, yeah. like every single day. And I remember when we were on a team together in 2016, I went into your room to ask for something and you were like getting the bike ready. And I noticed that you had a headlight and a taillight. And 
like I, I was like, gosh, that's just kind of clunky. Like, why does he need that on his bike? He's a pro. Okay. He's, he's riding in the dark, but like, that's kind of nerdy. You motivated me in, I think, 2017. So I have that exact same headlight and that exact same taillight on my bike to this day. And honestly, I can't ride without it. I mean, you motivated me to do this even before your 2018 crash. But what else can riders do, recreational riders do, besides the headlight, besides the, the crash protection, besides the taillight? What what can we do on the road to make ourselves a little bit more visible, a little bit more safe? Well, first of all, I think wear a helmet. This sounds stupid, but uh, I still see a lot of riders riding without a helmet. And uh, I say everybody hello. I'm very friendly, but if a rider doesn't wear a helmet, I don't say hello. So <laughs> that's that's one of my things. You know, I th I think everybody who's on a race bike they should wear a helmet because it can really save your life. And, you know, okay, you can ride the bike well and whatsoever, okay, but a car can come, don't see you, and if you crash, and you crash on your head, the helmet can save your life. So wear a helmet. And I also think that uh, a flashy clothing, uh, yeah, I saw some studies that if you wear, like, uh, fluo or, you know, bright colors, you get... Uh, easily being seen by 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 car drivers so don't wear dark uh if you wear dark on sunny days of course i don't have any problem but if it's kind end of the day early morning uh, yeah just wear bright colors and um now after some advice um for actual riders steam i think our listeners and me we we want to know how did you ever start cycling at what age how, how come You started cycling. How, wh wh why are you not a soccer player, for example? No, no, no. Actually, I started cycling at an early, at an early age, but never in competition because my father he did one year as a professional. Uh, so I was, yeah, I was always watching races on television. My uncles they rode the bike. My nephew was riding the bike, and they all did it in competition. But actually, I started out as a speed skater. What you know, Jensi. In Holland, it's spot number one, no? Yes. It's football and, and, and speed skating. So, And when I was 15, uh, I had a knee injury. So I couldn't do the Pacific uh, training anymore for in the summer for, for the speed skating. And they advised me to go on the bike. So then I started to ride the bike more and more. And yeah, then uh, at, when I was 16, I had my first license. So uh, in May 16, I started competition. And in August 16, I won my first criterium in Holland. Yeah, and then I, I did one more winter of, of speed skating and straight away I went into the road season as a, as a junior again. And I, yeah, since then I turned the pace. I, w I wanted to be a professional bike rider. And like I said at the beginning, you were fantastic. But that brings me to my next question. Why do you continue to ride? I mean, fitness is one thing, but you have to, I, I've always admired you for getting up so early in the morning and either going for a run or a bike ride. What does riding your bike mean to you now that your racing days are behind you? First of all, it calms me down a lot because if I don't ride the bike, I'm a little bit too enthusiastic and I have too high energy levels throughout the day. So uh, it calms me down a little bit. And also it gives me mental freedom. Uh, if you're out on a grand tour and Yeah, you're working long days. Uh, you're always surrounded by people. And if you leave, yeah, I would say between 5.30 and 6 in the morning and you have one and a half hour to ride your bike just for yourself, clearing the mind, you have a, a great start of the day. And uh, after that, you're, you know, you can handle a lot more. And that that's really something uh, I need to smash myself a little bit in the morning. I, I like that. I like to ride fast and to suffer a bit. Uh, and that maybe sounds crazy, but it really gives me a, a good feeling. And uh, yeah, when I'm done, I did the shower, then I come to breakfast and then, yeah, they can shoot everything 
what they wanted me and I can give them answers and what's wrong. I'm awake and I'm ready to go. Yeah. And I'm a terrible sleeper. I sleep well, but I sleep always very short. So luckily I don't need long nights. Um, so being a sport director also means endless hours in the car, right? So I believe yeah. the cycling helps you with that. Um, now that, well, I just turned 52. Do you sometimes have back problems when you're driving in the car for hours from the service course uh, back to the Vuelta or down to Italy? Or you still going up? The cycling keeps me so fit. I have no problem at all. No, I need the cycling. If I if I doing some long days in the car, I, I get back problems. And uh, I had really problems in the winter of 2012 where, yeah, where I had like a dislocated uh, disc and I had like yeah. a hernia from the left leg. And uh, the only thing I could do could do to protect me from pain was actually cycling because then it gives some space in the in the lower back part. But to sit in the car was was like just horror. It was really horror. Mm. Yeah. So uh, I need it also for that to keep the back a little bit good. Yeah. Sitting in the car doesn't help. No. <laughs> I know. We we recently had uh, Mate Mahorik on and. As you probably saw after he won stage 19 of the Tour de France this year, he gave a lot of credit to the staff. Uh, you know, they get up super early in the morning. They may have an hour worth of exercise. Then they're full gas all day long and they close the truck or go to bed at 11 and get up in the morning and do it the next day. I mean, what you guys do for these men, young men, young women, uh, for, for us, we don't normally see it. Um, I've been a little bit in the trenches with you. Jens has as well. We kind of know. But I remember, Jens, you were at this race. It was Tour de Pay Basque. I believe it was Tour de Pay Basque. It was a race in Spain somewhere. And my one of my favorite directors of all time was Kim Anderson. And he is still a director at your team. He works with you as a, as a DS. And he had his 50th birthday. I think I was 32 or 33. And he had just come in from a run and we found out that it was birth his birthday. And I said, how old are you? And he said, 50. And I was like, wow, that's old. You're turning 50 <laughs> next year. <laughs> Or this I will turning 50 in, in, two, in two months. Yeah, months. this yeah. year, actually. The end of November. Yeah. 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 I mean, Kim is still at it. How much longer yeah. do you think you would enjoy doing what you do putting in the hours that you put in and being away from home as much as you are is is this a lifetime thing are you going to be you know i i think what would that make kim in his mid 60s now um is this something that you see yourself doing for another 10 15 20 years no i don't think another another 10 15 years no i think no no i I really enjoy what I'm doing, but I think that uh, the long days and, and the big program and the, the full calendar, yeah, you know, will will limit uh, will limit. The, yeah, I will not do another 10 years like this. I I want to stay in the sport, but I also think that uh, I also like to enjoy to to teach what I have learned over the years to other people and. Uh, I think in the future, when we have more young DSs coming on board, I would really love to to coach them more and you know give them a structure where they can work from, and uh, you know be more in and out of the races and uh, do some less days on the road, but arrange more things from home and plan more things from home. I think uh, I think there's yeah there's a limit time of, of that you can give everything for this. It's it's long days. And now I don't have a problem with it. I really enjoy it. But I can see the day coming where where I can say that, ah, Stephen, now I think it's better that you do some less days on the road and do some more things from home, come into the race, see how the guys are doing and, you know, go back and maybe go some other place. I think that that will be, I think, my, my future. So in the years you have uh, left, 10 years, let's say just about 10 years time. What would be your dream result you want to achieve? You want to be the DS 
driving behind Mats Pedersen when he finishes all alone by himself on a velodrome in Roubaix? Or you want to be with Tahoe when he maybe wins the Vuelta next year? Or what would be the dream result for you? We go, yes, that is the moment. Well, I think the best result would be, I think, if, 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 if we have a win where the whole team uh, gave his ultimate best to, to get that win. I think if you have uh, a win where a rider won it actually by his own, but the team actually, yeah, you know, had a shit day, but still the rider was so good that he won the race. I think I would not be so happy. But even if it's Roubaix, you know, uh, I think if the team really performed at his best and then, you know, Mats finishes it off or whoever, Jasper finishes it off in Roubaix, I think I would be super happy. Uh I experienced before with 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 Alberto winning Giro and uh, Vuelta, and it's something what is really special. And of course, if we can win the Tour de France in in a couple of years' time, I think that would be great to be part of that. And uh, that would be, yeah, uh, I, I would be really happy with that. I've got pink juice now in the uh, where I'm in my pain cave where I'm riding uh, Swift sometimes in the winter. Uh, there's a pink jersey, there's a, a red jersey there from Alberto. Uh, yeah, it would be nice if there would be a yellow one as well. Okay, I, I have one last question um, because I do follow you on Strava. You are a coach, you are super fit. What is your, whatever you want to call it these days, FTP, functional threshold, power, solia, like, because you said you ride hard. And I yeah. have two good friends here in Greenville and we do not come close to your average speed. Um, we're not pumping those Watts, you know, consistently, you know, we may have a little hit out now and then, but like your average speed is just kind of like off the charts high, but what is your functional threshold power right now as a almost 50 year old director sportif for Lidl Trek? It's around 355, 360. That ain't fair, so, man. Yeah. Yeah. Poor my friend. So, that is bloody yeah. impressive. Yeah. And and tell our listeners and our viewers as well as Jens, what is your average speed when you're out riding? You said you like to ride fast. You like to hurt yourself, but it's kind of annoying. Well, it depends See, where I are. If I'm if I'm at, at home in Andorra, my average speed is not that high. But then, uh, if I do a lap with uh, a little bit more than thousand altitude meters, it will be still around. 33 so that would be good if i'm riding here back in holland uh yeah some days it's 38 some days it's a little bit lower some days it's a little bit higher so jens every time i see him when he's riding back in holland it's like 38 average it's just like that is not a coffee stop ride man that like that's no, your race, that's, race fit that's full gas wow steven it was great catching up with you man i mean you are it's going to be a very exciting year with what you guys, uh, what you guys are cooking in the kitchen over there at Lidl Trek. We wish you the best of luck. Um, that elusive Tour de France jersey hanging in your Zwift uh, pain cave would be great. But overall, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep developing these young riders and, and have fun out there. Stay fit and stay safe. For sure. Thanks. And we see you somewhere. It was good to see you there. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Huge thanks to Stephen for being our guest. Thanks for listening. And please give us a five-star review and share us with your friends. The show was a Velo production in association with Shock Giraffe. This episode was produced and edited by Mark Payne. Please remember to check out the video version of this podcast by heading to the Outside Watch YouTube channel. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and Facebook. Just head to at Bobby and Jens and give us a follow. Steven has both the red jersey from the Vuelta and the pink jersey from the Tour of Italy, but is missing the yellow jersey from the Tour de France in his pain cave. What would make your pain cave complete? Let us know at Bobby and Jens.